Well, hi, everybody. Um, welcome again to the podcast. Our guest today, a returning guest, is Lauren Heisey. She is a continuous improvement coach and consultant. She is a continuous business process improvement consultant, coach, trainer, and speaker. Lauren specializes in helping business owners and leaders from mid-sized organizations uncover and solve their business problems with continuous business process improvement using methods including Lean and Six Sigma. She helps businesses and organizations become simpler, faster, and better. So Lauren, welcome back to the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I, I, I love that. I mean, you know, that that purpose or that synopsis of, of what you do, simpler, faster, better. I, I, I Before we dig into the other topics we plan on talking about today, I'd love to hear kind of your synopsis of why those three words are so important. And, um, it's usually a lot of times in organizations, you know, you, you come across a, a lot of the red tape or we got a, a lot of things that are happening and it's not just uh, with processes, but it's also with technology. So what I would really love to do is help organizations and businesses to understand that sometimes it's better to do things simpler so we can be faster and then become better, not just for the company itself, but also for the employees and the customer and your customers or clients. Yeah. And that's when we, when we do this well, um, that, that, that those benefits are there for, for all stakeholders uh, for sure. And it's good to keep that, that all in balance. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Just sometimes doing it simpler is, is, is some of the better things to do versus trying to do like really trying to, there are a lot of technology at the problem or complicating things. Sometimes it's just better to start with something very simple. Mm-hmm. And we, we talked about um, technology, um, the, the time when Lauren was previously a guest back in July, 2020, <clears throat> that was episode 376. We talked about um, Lean and Six Sigma and, and technology, including um, AI or artificial intelligence. And you know, I think we can take a, a deeper dive here today on some of those topics. It'll be um, good to learn from you today, looking at you know people, process, and, and technology. You know, maybe you know one other question before we dive into you know some of the the integration or application of these technologies. Um, we might be preaching to the choir here with the audience, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on why we, we we need to avoid automating a bad process. Yeah, so a lot of times I'm finding um, there's I think the main reason why we find um, problems with automating bad processes when we will you see how bad that process is a lot faster, but when we automate a bad process, especially we don't um, include the employees or anyone within um, within solutioning for that is because you'll get low adoption rates. Um, a lot of times what I'm seeing with my clients is that they are spending so much money on technology and putting it in a, into a process that is a, that is um, a bad process. And they what's happening is they're not realizing the ROI with all that very, very fast enough. And so alienating the customers, alienating the employees, and then at, at the end of the day, the bottom line was affected by implementing that technology and not getting that, that ROI. And so what I'm seeing is a lot of um, organizations are not understanding how to maybe first go slow and then figure out the right place to do it, improve things. But then also then they are losing, um, they're losing traction in the digital transformations, losing traction within their strategy that they had put out for themselves, you know, within 2020, 2021 and 2022 and two as things are still Mm -hmm. really uh, crazy in the marketplace right now. Yeah. Um, so we'll, I think, be able to dive into that a little bit deeper, um, you know, during the discussion here. And I forget if I used this example last time, but you know, I can think of examples of not automating a bad process, even without software technology being involved. Uh, many hospital laboratories, for example, would have their old layout of the laboratory based on uh, process silos. So this is not unlike a, man- a manufacturing facility back in the day or a job shop that would have all the grinding machines in an area and all the welding machines in an area. Laboratories might be set up where all the chemistry analyzers are in one area and all the hematology analyzers are in a different room. And, you know, I've I've, I've seen times when then people would put in robotic um, automation, kind of, you know, carrying tubes throughout this really bad layout instead of maybe first coming in, it sounds obvious. And then you feel, um, almost like a jerk for pointing it out, like the need to rearrange the layout 
And then let's see if we even need to automate it once we've improved the layout in a way that improves flow. So sorry, I'll get off the soapbox there, but it's a mistake a lot of organizations make, right? They do. They do. I've I've been called in with, with, with a bunch of my clients where they bought this technology and it, you know, they're not seeing it work as they expected. And what I usually like to coin, they're throwing the new uh, flashy tool or new, new flashy tool at a problem without really understanding what's going on. And in and, and the point where you're just talking about if sometimes if you just change the layout, you don't necessarily don't need that automation. The same can hold true within services as well, or, you know, and it's and if it's either front office, back office, any of that, if you don't have a good process, it's just you're just gonna see how bad it is a lot faster. And like you said, sometimes you don't even need that automation in there to make it simple first. Yeah. And I know you're gonna have other examples um, of that today. So, you know, last time we talked about AI, artificial intelligence. I think there's an opportunity you're gonna share with us about some other technologies. So maybe we, you know, before thinking of examples or um, you know, how best to integrate these technologies, if you can help us with some, some definitions first. Um, RPA, rapid process automation. I've, I've heard this discussed a couple of times at conferences. I'm still not sure if I really understand what it is. So how, how would you define rapid process automation? Um, well, it's, you know, well, it's robotic process automation. Robotic um, process. Okay, I'm, automation. I'm, I'm mixing up my acronyms. See? <laughs> Sorry. So robotic process automation, um, it, it's just, a, I like to think of it just as a term or as automation has been around for a very long time. We all know that, but the robotic process automation is really just um, creating a different type of bot. And it's really a simple bot and it, could, and it doesn't have to be a physical bot. It could be something software based. And basically what it's doing um, is taking a very easy task and just automating it. So it's take, taking away the human doing that. So a good example would be something to, along the lines of data entry. Um, a lot of times, you know, if you get, if you have, I'm gonna use account, um, accounting might be a good a good example. You have something come in off of a, you know, fax or a bill, you know, some type of bill come in and within your own accounting department, you have to pay that. So basically you're putting in all the man, you're just putting in things manually or sometimes an email comes in. So what happens here is that a an RPA could just be used to take that email and then it scrapes the email and then it inputs it into the system for you so that it re- re- relieves the manual task, but it also can reduce some of the, some of the error, human error that would be there. Um, and then we'll go, uh, I'll just jump right into that. So machine learning, machine learning um, or even AI is just like, so RPA is usually the, the, the single or it's, is, is usually the first entry into t- using any type of um, automation. Then the next step is, um, and a lot of people just start talking about AI machine learning, but I think the next step after that is creating what's called intelligent automation or IA. Intelligent automation is just the next evolution where it start where the automation is starting to learn. So think of it as a kid. Um, so you have, you know, when a kid, we have to teach a kid and as they go through school, they start to learn new things. That's really what all the intelligent automation is. You just build, you just build in the tools for the automation to continue learning as it develops. And that just then leads into machine learning and then the AI as well. And then of course, now we have this whole new thing called hyper automation, which is another coin, but I think hyper automation is more of a framework. So it really just depends on where your evolution is at. Um, and that's, yeah, I want to go around. It's probably the best way to, to start with it. RPA first, then we go all the way into AI and hyper in the hyper automations in the uh, machine learning. So going back to just follow up question on um, RPA and 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 I'm, I'm used to acronyms <laughs> with the R rapid improvement event, for example, right. RIE. I got tripped up there. Um, uh, when we talk about automating simple tasks, is there less risk than uh, we're, we're not automating a process or there, is there, right. there's less risk of suboptimizing something with that type of automation? Yeah, there is. There, there's a lot less risk at, at risk at doing that first. And that's why usually when, like we say, let's start with the simple, simple tools first. I'm not, so I hate using the tools and I know, um, I know a lot of times people throw around the toolbox and I, and I use that a lot too, right? Cause I like to use the toolbox because it's using the right thing for the right time. I, and that just resonates with people, but doing something simple first before trying to get to the more um, complex stuff 
is the is the path is the path to go. So usually when I'm working with clients, it's more in that going in and just doing process improvements. It, it really is going in and looking at what exactly is the strategy that they want to do, understanding what their current state is. And I think that those are, those are the first two key things that need to, we need to understand because if you try to do a whole big digital transformation, I think a lot of people get lost and they're mm-hmm. thinking, oh, we want to do this whole big thing, but instead of let's, we got to start slow and then build, um, build on, build on the simple things before you can get to the complex things. Yeah. Maybe just as another definition there, and maybe this is a, a really vague, broad term, digital transformation. I mean, what, 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 what does that mean? It's a digital transformation. So a lot, so a lot of people have been thrown into um, digital transformation has been become very speedy over the last couple of years because mm-hmm. of the pandemic. But digital transformation is really taking the is really taking away the it's taking away the mundane task at the at the at the, at the gist of things is what I like to say. So um, when I think of like the hype, so that's where that like I said the new thing up now out there is hyper automation. Um, basically, I take it as a framework. So usually you have this digital transformation. Somebody up at, you know in the up in the C suite has this vision. It usually starts with the CIO, and then also the COO is usually involved with it as well now, and even the CFO is like, how much can we how much things can we take away from like say mundane task? How many things can we digitize to make things better? Um, and at the end of the day, it should theoretically cost the company less money to do work. You should be able to do, be more productive with the same number of people or less that you already have. Um, and it's just um, it's, it's, it's just being very, very fast in the way the technology is growing. So I'm used, for example, we were all used to being in an office. Now we all mm-hmm. had to all very scrambled at the beginning of 2020 to figure out different ways from working from home. Now we're looking at ways to do things hybrid. So you have to have a lot of things um, instead of having physical paper of things and, and physical things um, and that are done, usually done in person. We now have to think about how do you put it up on the cloud? How do we get all of our people to work together in different locations now because everyone it's you know remote is is part of the whole workforce now and it's not gone away how do we get people to work together in a hybrid environment when we're all over the world too so it's Mm. digital transformation is just a transformation of a company from being very physical to being very um very fluid with it with the technology that's out there and, and all the digital things that are available to us now yeah so is you know we talk about lean transformation that that aims high. It sounds like digital transformation is really a more holistic rethinking of everything. It's not just turning phone calls into Zoom meetings or turning right. in person user conferences into virtual events. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it's it's more than just turning something from analog to digital or right. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And a lot of people don't. And that's, I think that's where a lot of people get mis, uh, um, get hung up on the digital transformation. It, it is, it's just, it's just, and that's why I think, I, I think the digital transformation and lean kind of go together because it helps because it's by doing that double trans, I call it maybe not even a double, just a transformation overall. It changes the way culture and the, it changes the culture in the company. It changes the way we do business and it changes the way um, how rapidly we can really change if, the, if there's different if there's different things going on in the market or if our workforce changes as we seem to right the workforce is is very fluid right now. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to these technologies, um, you know, at a high level, uh, I imagine there's a risk. I mean, any of these labels or technologies or a new shiny thing. Um, why, uh, you know, what, what are some examples or, or warnings of, you know, like not jumping, not falling in love with the solution, not jumping into a solution because it's trendy or because competitors are doing it? Like, what, what, what's a g- good example of trying to think through some better problem solving? Yeah, so I've got a, a couple of good examples. Um, I have a client that was working on their sales function. Um, they bought this technology for their sales folks. Um, I'm not going to throw, I'm not going to tell what technology out there because I don't want to put any technology, sure. throw any technology under the bus because there's so many different tools out there. Sure. Um, but they, they um, originally they started with something homegrown and then they figured out, hey, this RPA could really, really, really help us in our digital transformation. So let's just throw some patches on this homegrown tool that we have. 
and then maybe we'll, um, and then they started purchasing different RPA solutions from different providers and just trying to piecemeal it. And so they were just trying to throw together a solution without really truly understanding that the old technology and old process could not handle the, the new technology that they're trying to throw at it. So what they saw was low adoption rates, um, I think only about 20% of their sales force and, 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 and accounting, because it was quote to cash, were using that. Um, there's no trans, uh, there's no tra- they had no, tra- uh, that tra- I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong word. <laughs> mm. uh, they had no visibility into what was going on in the system, right? So no visibility with sales. Sales didn't know um, what was in operations, what did they have in their backlog, what they had in inventory, but they also didn't realize um, what was going on with with accounting. They weren't getting, um, things weren't, bills of the bills weren't getting paid and the vendors weren't getting paid. So what they realized is that they had to stop what they were doing with their RPA, with their RPA, which they were trying to coin as a digital transformation mm. and realized they had to take a full step back, halt all the stuff that they were doing and really just go in and start process mapping. <laughs> it's something very, yeah. very simple and understanding what does the current state look like? I'm um, using a value stream map and then using the really detailed process maps to understand the data flows and, um, and, and understanding the customer journey because they had probably uh, 50 different types of personas in their customer journey. And then they also had um, probably about 100 different ways they could receive an order from a customer. Mm. So realizing it was just they had too complex to where they had to completely do um, a rebuild of their quote to cash. And so doing a rebuild, having a, you know different, different types of um, workshops to, to build out this new, this new model. And then when they came, finally came up with a future state, they had a future state um, value stream map. But then on top of that, they also had a technology roadmap. So that's a perfect example of it's still in process today. So they're still working through it. Um, it's not a small, it's not a, a two-month journey. This is going to be a, this is a two-year, a two-year journey that they have to go through to get to where they want to be. Um, and, you know, within about six, and I think in about six months it is that they're going to start um having the technology put in, they've already implemented the new processes, even though they're still manual, it's get, it's a much better story than what they were trying to do before. And so as a, it sounds like there's um, a reminder to be had. Uh, what I heard you saying was um, rapid, I keep saying rapid, robot, <laughs> old habits die hard. Robotic <laughs> process automation is not digital transformation. Maybe as a parallel to, no offense to right. 5S, Doing 5S is not the same as a lean transformation. Exactly. Exactly. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Um, so can can you tell us a little bit more about personas? Like that that's a term I've heard in software land, kind right. of trying to understand um, users and their needs, um, e- even in marketing, um, talking about yeah. personas of um, who it is who's buying your products or services. Tell, tell us a little bit more about personas and and how that's helpful. Yeah. So understanding the the customer persona. So um, in this, and personas don't have to necessarily be all external. They can also be internal, which we all know that in the lean, in the lean world um, is that understanding um, it's, it's when a lot of times we'll go through their persona development. So so what does your customer look like? What, 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 what are their needs that you need to what, need, what needs or problems are you trying to solve for them? Um, who are they? I mean, mm-hmm. they can be in different parts of an organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be that CEO. It might just be the manager. The frontline manager needs something. Um, or it could be, so understanding what their job titles are, what they are, what keeps them up at night a lot of times, and then understanding what their habits are. So use for the example of, of my client that was doing the quote to cash where they had all these different personas, we came up with the five major, there are five major personas because they realized um, 80% of the business was only coming from like 20% of mm-hmm. these customers. So what, what happened there was creating more of a streamlined process for quote to cash for those particular personas. And then the ones that they didn't necessarily, the onesie twosie people, like, you know, the personas on the bottom would still come in through the same channels. Um, now there was, they did have some personas that were old, like in the old days, still using fax machines to send in their orders. <laughs> oh, wow. 
And so understanding, and so by understanding those personas, and then that helps with, as you're changing the process, then you can work with your, with your clients or customers and help teach them the new ways of doing the process, because it's great to have a new process. It's great for the company, but if your customers aren't going to use it, then you're going to lose your customers. So that's the biggest thing is understanding those personas. Now, if you think about the personas internally, who are the internal customers? It's, it's the same thing. It's just doing a, just maybe mapping out who those um, who those people are because that really does help with the um, adoption rate when it comes to using the new technology, new using new processes, but it also helps with change management and teaching both internal and external um, customers how to use that new process and bringing them along for the ride. So, and it, my understanding of personas is it goes beyond demographics. Right, it does. But I think they they use the term. So it's not just let's say you know age, job title, gender, things like that um, that you might use to to segment segment or differentiate um, in terms of people's needs, but uh, psychographic data, which which goes deeper in terms of it their does. needs, their um, priorities. It it really it's a deeper level understanding where demographics might be a little right. bit more superficial. Yeah, that's exactly it. Is yeah, that's getting down to it. And even if it's even if it's um, it can be even very be just it can be the industry specific as well, right? So, I had a client that's a wholesaler, um, and we had to do some personal development just based on what they do with wholesale, and and then they also looked at you know looking at what their competitors did as well, so that helps them to define what's the what's the best process or journey for their customer. And then, you know, come back to the point of not just leaping into a solution. It seems like there'd be an opportunity there to, um, to, to use A3 problem solving or A3 thinking. Are there times yes. where you actually sort you know, get a client or an organization to kind of pump the brakes on the technology and step back and ask those really good upper left-hand corner of the A3 questions of, What's the background? What's the situation? Yes. Making sure they've defined the problem. Can, can you kind of tell us more about that? Yeah. So um, I had a client where I was um, a financial client that I was working with at the beginning of last year, um, understanding it was a call center issues. So they had high call center calls coming in and they thought that was the problem was they needed to defer or get or realize how could they get people to stop calling in? Well, after we started understanding, I'm like, okay, that's great. But really, what's the business problem you're trying to solve for? Why, why are you having this issue? Or why do, you know, what's the business problem? And the business problem was they just, you know, there was a lot of different ones and um, they didn't have enough people to staff the call center. They couldn't bring people into the live call center um, area as well because, you know, of the pandemic, they were doing rotating cycles. But also then their customers, they didn't understand their customer demographics or understand what the customers really needed. So um, just taking a step back and understanding what was the business problem and really what the business problem came down to is one, they were losing their customers. Um, so they were losing revenue because they're losing their customers, but then their costs were going up high because they didn't understand the customer. And then they were also, because um, they were B2B and B2C, they were paying their, their, um, they were paying their clients a lot of money because they were missing those call the they are missing their KPIs, right? So caught people were sitting on hold for way too long. So they had to turn around and just pay all that money. So, um, and then of course, a lot of overtime yeah, costs come right. into that too. So would it, by understanding what the business, true business problem was then helped us to define, okay, this is the problem. And then we had, um, I think we had five problems through, we had five problems and then we had five um, things we worked towards to produce, right? So it was like a, uh, whole times, the reduced cost for overtime hours, the reduced um, losing the their customer churn as well, and of course their employee churn. Um, so instead of just looking at a call center process, we looked at them um, because it was a it was two products, doing a full product value stream map for each product and understanding the cycle of what the customers had to go through, what people had to go through internally. That helped by just understanding what the business problem was. And that's part of the um, strategy we had to do first versus just dump, you know, um, jumping right into what the problems were. Mm -hmm. I can imagine maybe there's different scenarios, um, let's say with a call center where people might want 
technology to better handle the calls when right. part of good A3 problem solving might be looking at, well, what, what's the customer confusion? What are the customer right. issues that are leading to the calls? I could even think of, let's say, a doctor's office. Um, they'll embrace technology where they almost it's more effective to just message through the app than it is to try to call. Right. So there's some technology there, but let's say, you know, patients are always, or very frequent, not always, but very frequently calling with follow-up questions from their appointment. At some point you might double back and say, well, wait a minute. It seems like there's a high percentage of people are confused with the care instructions. Could we go back and change the way we're communicating it in a way that would eliminate the need for calls or messages? Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly. It's the same. It was the th- same thing at the call center. Um, like, um, it, what was prompting? They couldn't figure out. Um, there was no predictability when these calls were coming in, and so, but well, we found the predictability actually. <laughs> Data yeah. was there. You just had to dig. You just had to dig for it and piecemeal it together. But um, we were able to predict what was calling, and that's where. That's the same thing with the with the doctor's office, right? You can predict. Okay, why are we getting this many calls? Well, maybe that point of communication is not the best communication maybe mm-hmm. and, it, and that's where the customer persona has kind of come back as well as understanding um that journey and then asking the questions okay is the technology really working no it's not let's take the technology out of the equation first and then figure out what exactly we need to do with processes and then you add in the technology as part of the solutions at the end it's funny that that what we said there about we can't predict or we don't know. Um, uh, I've I've seen people shoot down that argument. Different environment, um, emergency rooms, right. and I remember seeing an ER doc who was really um, you know deep in, into lean, um, who, who pointed out you know people would say we can't predict. This. If you actually you know if you look at the data, it's quite predictable. You don't know exactly how many, but you can predict it hour by hour, day by day. Yeah well enough to then change your staffing levels in a way that better meets demand. And he, I remember the, this, this, this surgeon, um, it's actually somebody I interviewed a long time ago, Joe Garisco. Um, you know, he would overlay their demand pattern uh, against that of another hospital. And like the absolute peak, the number of patients might be different, but he's, yeah, we, 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 we fool ourselves or we convince ourselves things aren't measurable, aren't predictable. And then right. um, sometimes it really is. It is. And it, yeah, that's it. And when I, we know this call center, this one was interesting was that the call center itself and the other organ, the or, other organization were working together with their data. So they yeah. were always, and this is where it's interesting when you put the two data, when you put data points together, sometimes you have to put those together instead of just uh, isolating different data pools. And so, you know, everybody was pointing fingers. And I said, no, let's just take a deep dive into the data. It took it took me a little while to do it with the help of some of their um, business analysts. But um, once we started looking at the data, we're like there is a, some predictable things that we could see. So these announcements would go out. And depending on how the person received the announcements, and they could sometimes they were put in snail mail, sometimes they were in email, sometimes it was just something they saw on TV. Um, so if you see it, that, and then I was like, well, let's, let's figure and put all that together. Let's take the, where the spikes were coming from, put the data from when all the stuff was going out and you can predict, um, is either within, um, hours to weeks, depending on the mode of trans the, the mode of transportation, I guess is a better way to put it, right? The transportation of the data going, of these things going out and you can predict it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Lauren, I, I'd like to hear more. You know, earlier you mentioned the need or the opportunity to do process mapping or value stream mapping. You know, for, for one, how, how would you define or distinguish between process mapping and value stream mapping? Yeah, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna st- I'm gonna steal some words from Karen Martin. Yeah. <laughs> I think sure. she was she put it in a blog in a LinkedIn post. Um, this is probably last year, where like a value stream map looks more of it's more of a, it's like the map itself. So I think of it like a Google. And you're looking at Google, right? It shows you all the different systems, like the, the all the interstates that are coming across. Mm-hmm. And then when you get down into detail, and then you get down it 
into um because that's high level and you can see yeah. what high level what a process is you should be able to see um data flows in there too but it also shows you the customer journey and then cycle time and wait time and all and all that information but then the detailed process map is more of your directions your directions you're right right turn here left mm -hmm. turn here go down two miles you know that's yeah. turn the corner store right that's where i think a detailed process map is um it, it's usually a box out of that bias your map and that's the next layer down yeah. so that's how I, I usually like to define it so when i'm working with clients doing the value stream map that first opens their eyes they're like oh i didn't realize the customer had all this mm -hmm. data coming at them and all this other data is going here and then they can see the numbers, but then when you get down and do it with the detail process map, a lot of times they don't even realize how detailed and what and the different decision points and waiting points are along the detail process as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that distinction for one. Um, you know, like when you look at the high level, you can then understand maybe where you need to go take the deeper dive more right. strategically. I, I think there's risk of, of getting um getting down into the weeds or to use different plant analogies, uh, losing the forest for the trees, I think is yeah. the, I think is the expression of um, understanding the high level first. And you know, I, I would add, you know, what I've seen with process maps, very, very detailed. And it kind of assumes magically that this happens, then this, then this, then That's maybe there's great. a decision point, then that, where value stream maps at that higher level help us understand the delays. Right between yes. the high level steps, which can be, um, that, that, that often shows far more potential than just trying to improve different steps would show. Exactly. And that, and a lot of times when I'm working with my clients, they want to just go in and do one specific area. And I said, well, how about we look at it more holistic and you know, let's look at everything from an end to end perspective. And that's where like, and that's where they, sometimes they don't realize, okay, let's go tackle um, the finance area first or the sales area. And I said, we, we need to map out high level what this looks like first before we even get into one certain area. Because we're sometimes they think the problem is really isn't the right, isn't usually the right mm -hmm. place. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but it, it's usually, it takes the data and it's not, um, takes the data, but it also, I think the gut, your gut feelings are, are great to have, but then I think the data helps tell the true story of what's really going on. Yeah. And, and I think, and you, you touched on this, the, um, other really important thing in a value stream would include those information flows. Right. Starting from the customer, how are they communicating? Um, understanding all of that is really important. Yeah, it is. And it, the data flow, and a lot of times some companies, and this is where, where it's important for, for a digital transformation is understanding those data flows for the different parts of the organization. Because sometimes they don't realize how many different systems are involved with those different data flows as well. And um, so, yeah, so just to, to recap a little bit, you know, I'm thinking of a real example of driving from uh, the Dallas area down to San Antonio. There's the high level view right. and the strategic decision of, am I going to take I-35, which is shorter, but probably more dangerous and probably more frustrating and more variation versus taking the country scenic route right. that I know like best case is longer than the I-35 best case. So you, you, you make that high level decision, then you get down into the weeds of even with that scenic route, do we go through that small town or that other small town? That's, that's to me, the more detailed process map. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah, Definitely. I appreciate that analogy. Um, so can, can you share some other examples where, you know, it was really beneficial to do that mapping, um, both, both current state mapping and, and, and how that map um, at some point gets transformed into a future state that people have to dream up, kind of observing here's the, the real reality current state versus let's think to what could be better. Okay. Um, I had a client, I had a client for their account in their accounting area where we um, mapped out what the current state looked like. So we started the value stream map first and then we, and then we went into down each, you know, went down to the detail process map for each box of the, of the value stream. Um, and while doing that, you know, you uncover, you do, it, it helps with, you know, problem solving, um, root cause analysis, um, buy-in from the frontline workers, because you got to understand what they're doing for their day-to-day -day job, but then also understanding the technology that they're using or lack of using. 
um, even if it's already been implemented. Um, and then once I do that, when we when I work with my clients, then we you know, of course, we do a lot of problem solving, root cause analysis, do gimba, you know, do gimba walks. And of course, along the way, I'm training, I'm training the leaders not to sit in their offices. Even if you're in a remote environment, you can still do gimba walks with your folks each week and try to understand what's going on. Um, and once we did that problem solving and understand what's going on and then what ha- what solves what and then doing that the solutioning um when you do the future state a lot of times the waiting time is taken away cycle times reduced um it's just it's a lot it's a simpler map i like to say than it was you know than um it was when we first started but out of the it's that's how i move into the future state but when we're doing the future state and solutioning i also like to, to say okay once we implement and let's say make everything as standard as possible and have the best data that we can use, because that's everything too, when it comes to any type of technology, we have to have really good data. Otherwise it's not, that nothing's really gonna work, right? And once we get there, what's next? What's the next steps the future for the, for the future? So it's not just process improvement, but how do we incorporate that technology and into that future state? So we have a technology roadmap that that aligns with a future state. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and it's usually start, and it usually is starting out a strategy. What's the business problem we're trying to solve for? What are the issues that we see? And that helps us, you know, determine where we need to go. Yeah. And, and not to hijack the conversation or, or turn this into an ad for Kinexus, but that's one technology that I'm familiar with. And yeah. have been involved with for over a decade. And, and Kinexus uses that same language really around process, people, and technology. What is your improvement process or right. methodology? How are you engaging your people and leading them? And then what is your technology? So I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts here where somebody might, whether they're going to use this language or not, digital transformation. We, we are going to digitize or transform our suggestion box process. And okay. you know, there are a lot of people, there are software companies that will basically create a digital version of a suggestion box. But I think we could step back and challenge, like, well, are we just digitizing the suggestion box? So let's map out your process of like, well, people put things into a box once a month or once a quarter, we open the physical box and then some sort of committee management team level maybe reviews the suggestions and then rejects most of them. Like, (laughs) why would you want to digitize that? Like you could then step back and say, well, maybe we need to turn our suggestion box process into more of a Kaizen process right? where it's more continuous. It doesn't flow up to a committee or leadership who might not really understand the situation. You know, you could map out and, and, and thinking through, well, here's what we want our improvement process to be. And now let's find a technology that facilitates that, I think is right. a, a much better thought process. It, it leads to better results. It sure does. It's, and that's what, you know, it's a, a suggestion box and remind me of a, uh, was it the office they had <laughs> using a suggestion box and they haven't looked at it in like three years. <laughs> well, um, uh, you mean uh, the, the Michael Scott yeah, character yeah. and all of them, the office? I don't remember that. Yeah, I just saw, my, we just, my husband and I just watched that the other day um, when we were, uh, I think we, when we were traveling. Um, but uh, what's interesting is, yeah, that's one thing that people are always like, oh, they won't take, they won't listen to my suggestions mm-hmm. or they don't do anything that I say or, you know, my manager just doesn't understand or the VP doesn't understand. So I think automating that process um that i think there's a few things it's not just automating it but it's also keeping the leaders engaged with their frontline mm-hmm. workers and opening that door of communication so when they receive a suggestion or, or see that there is a problem let's fix it now instead of you know six months down the road i think that's part of the whole kaizen continuous mm-hmm. improvement um, culture is let's fix the issue now and having that open door of communication instead of, you know, the vice president sitting behind his closed door every day. How about you get out there and do, mm-hmm. do Gimba? <laughs> yeah. And that's, I think that's really important to see when it comes to technology, because I think um, the frontline workers need to, they need to know how to use their technology, but they also need to know how to make suggestions to continually improve that technology. Cause it's, you know, it's not a one-stop shop when you implement, well, we, we, we both know that it's not a one-stop shop. 
once you've done the improvements, we improved it and that has now become your new current state. Mm -hmm. So you get to continually improve as the future state because the world is so more fluid than it's ever been. Um, and I think um, I think the C suite start to understand that. I think the frontline workers sure. start to see that. So I, I'm hoping as the future as we evolve in the future, we start to see more of that fluid environment. Yeah. You know, earlier you used the phrase technology adoption rates. You know, I've seen, unfortunately, you know, organizations where the adoption rate of the suggestion box is really low because people say, well, I, they, they don't listen to me. It's probably not worth the effort uh, or I'm afraid I'm going to get blamed. You know, there's those okay. factors of not just fear, but futility. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of um, really nice looking huddle boards put up in organizations where thinking even of a bulletin board or a whiteboard right. as a technology or thinking of some of these Kaizen approaches as a technology, if, if the adoption rate is really low when it's analog, like we, we probably shouldn't expect, like if we digitize that, we, we shouldn't expect the adoption rate to be any higher really, right? That's correct, right. Yeah, if you put, yeah, if you digitize something, it's not necessarily going to increase adoption rate or improve things. And that's where automating something or implementing or digitizing a bad process is not the way to go. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier the idea of doing virtual Gemba walks. I was wondering if you could tell us more about that, if you have an example, if you have thoughts on how that could or should work. Let's say if somebody's got now a distributed team of remote working from home employees, how, what, what does a Gemba visit or a Gemba walk mean in that context? Yeah, so that's it. So I know there's been a lot of debate on, on doing these virtually versus in person. So um, I've done, I've done, I've done them virtually for uh, probably the last twelve years. Different, different organizations. I mean, it's great to have if you could do them physically. But really, what it is is um, is it's it's the same. It's the same thing as doing a. Uh, an in-person game walk is going out there and talking to the frontline employees and understanding um, how are things going? That's just, I think a lot of it's just listening. And a lot of times they're the ones that are going to have the solution. So how do you usually do that? Um, There's different ways you can have, um, I usually say have those team doing those stand-up calls once, you know, once, once a morning or, maybe three times a week, depending on how, it, and depending on, the, it really depends on time zones and everything. But then also having the leaders meet one-on-one with their folks is also very important. So it's great to have the team environment and doing that, the standups in, in different in different modes, depending what and how it works best for you. Um, I've seen a client where we where we did standups, um, we did three day, three times a week. We did start doing them once a week, I'm sorry, once a day. But realized with the time zones, it was just got too it got too crazy for um, the operations the operations team to do that. So they started it doing it three times a week, and they really Monday was okay. What 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 are you working on this week? Wednesday was how are things going, and the Friday was really just um, a retrospective. Um, it was mm-hmm. supposed to be fun, like and it was no camera. And I had a client that one way they did it was they had no camera Fridays. So Fridays, you didn't have to be all dressed up if you, because they were all remote. Let's just, you could work in your PJs all day if you wanted. Nobody has to see it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if people are really fully dressed up. <laughs> right, exactly. On, exactly. On, with the camera on, or at least, you know, we might be wearing the dress shirt and workout shorts. I've been uh, guilty of that. But Yeah, I've been guilty of that too. But um, <laughs> but I think I think that uh, those type, of, those are, um, those are just one way of doing it. And then of course the one-on-ones and then just, um, I, you know, meeting with the teams and uh, having leaders meet with their teams, um, you know, on a regular basis, right? So um, having that open door communication, and that, with, and it's really important for the leaders to understand that they they have to they have to initiate that with their with their folks. And while it may seem really hard to do, especially when we're all time crunched, it is the, I think one of the most important things to do. And with a gimbal walk, it's just listening to your employees, listening mm-hmm. to the frontline workers, because they're the ones that are going to know what truly is going on. And they're probably going to have an alarm like, hey, this customer is feeling this way before it even reaches the C-suite. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to yeah. know. And by so by doing a virtual gimbal walk, it's, just, it's really just getting out there and just meeting with them on a regular basis. You said go and listen. I just jotted down a note there to 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 bring up that idea because a lot of times people talk about you know the related term to 
to Gemba, uh, you might say Genshi Gembutsu, which, you know, um, go and see is often okay. how that's translated. So you could go and observe how work is being done. If you're a vice president or a leader, you could observe a virtual huddle meeting. Right. You could observe and you, and you can listen to the conversations people are having about improvement. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, just generally speaking, go and understand. Right. Might be a useful concept where I could think there might be a trap where uh, somebody's got a dashboard. Executives love dashboards, right? Zero. So I could see at my desk, I can see the number of improvement ideas being implemented every week or every day and kind of drill down by departments or, or areas. Well, you could see the data, but then if you see some organ- some departments are underperforming others, the data right. doesn't tell you why. Or Exactly. Um, like my, my, my co-author from the healthcare Kaizen books, Joe Schwartz has used real examples where you could see, let's say an, an, a department or a team had been performing really high on Kaizen. And then there's a big drop off. That's good to know, but the chart doesn't tell you why. So oh. these, these, yeah. you know, uh, what do you call it? You know, a virtual Gemba visit or a phone call or a zoom call, like going to, to better understand the situation to grasp the situation instead of making guesses or making assumptions or just getting upset about the result. Like we've got to understand what's going on in the process or the team or the system that leads to the result. Exactly. It's exactly. I think it's so I think the two go hand in hand. It's like, so you can see the data and you know what, if you're out there having those, those, those get those, give a walks all the time and under in understanding you understand that what what truly is going on and a lot of times it could it's not i think sometimes people want to blame blame the people but it really is the process or Mm -hmm. the it's usually the process and then the Mm -hmm. technology then the people right so people only follow what they are being are being told to pretty much hold it not being told but the process they're they're supposed to be using and if there's an issue with that then you can easily remedy remedy that when you're doing those gamma walks and having yeah. that continuous improvement culture that also allows for learning and allows for the, like I said, the open communication and teamwork. I think it's collaboration. It's not just, you know, here, go do this. It's understanding, really understanding, truly understanding the people. Yeah. So we're trying to understand the current state or understanding, we're trying to better understand what's happening. Um, one, one, one thing you talk about is process mining. How is yeah. that different than process mapping or Gemba visits to go and understand? What, what do you mean by process mining? Process mining is a tool, um, mm-hmm. is a is it's a technology tool. So um, back in the day, we would have to sit there um, with a time with a, a stopwatch, right? And do cycle time. Well, you mm-hmm. know, now that things are more, uh, we have more technology, more, and we have a lot of service based stuff going on. You don't necessarily have to do that with the stopwatch. You have these process mining tools out there. I think Apple More is one of them, is one of, is a good one to name off. What, what, Where they what's go, that tool? I'm sorry. It's called Apple More. Okay. So they so basically what that does is it goes in and it look it takes the the data out of the system and it tries to map out the processes it best can. Um, it it's on it's automatically done. There's n- there's not a lot of human intervention once you set it up. I mean it just it looks at the different transactions. Um, I think it it really helps. It, so it's I, I think that's just the piece of that. It's just the piece of the pie or the piece of the puzzle, right? When you're doing a current state. I think it just speeds up the the data analysis a lot faster, and then I like to do, use that with um, with doing the process mapping. So looking at the future, I'm sorry, looking at the value stream map, current state, and the detailed um, process map, and it helps plug in those two putting those two together help plug um, help create a more holistic end to end map. I mean, the process mining, like I said, it's just all tool based. But it doesn't look at the people's feelings. It doesn't look at, well, what are the true causes? It just kind of paints, it starts to paint that picture for you. And it just does it a lot faster than if we had to sit there with a stopwatch, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, final question for you, Lauren. You know, you, you talk about putting two things together. Um, I was wondering if you know of a good example or, or even a scenario of what would be a really powerful combination of both lean transformation and digital transformation. Good combination. Um, 
That is, so that I do that, I would say I try to do that all the time with my clients. So usually when I'm with my client, they've been frustrated. Um, A lot of times we usually start with, uh, usually we start in the easiest area first. And I'm going to say that's, um, we should put the digital transformation into an area first. Mm -hmm. So finance and accounting, or even the quote to cash sales areas are some of the easier areas to start first. And that's where we put in, if you can put the transform the the transformation of lean and digital transformation together, you're creating a, a, a kind of a continuous improvement culture, right? Or lean mm-hmm. culture that includes technology. So once you start with those areas, it then it and you're really successful in those in those first few areas, then the rest of the company or organizations are going to want to do the same thing. So I think that's part that's the best way that I approach that and put those two together. Is start in one area that's easy. Mm-hmm. And then we move into the more complex areas as the, as we go along in that journey. It, it seems like a different dimension to decide where to start could be, sure, what's easiest? Where okay. is there agreement or alignment or pull from the leaders versus yes. what do we think is the highest impact on the organization? I mean, it's, in, in my experience, there's something to be said for starting small, right. proof of concept to then help build up the energy or the courage to tackle something bigger and or more meaningful. Exactly. That's usually how we, do, that's the best way to do it is, is to start there and then get it out there. Sometimes I know people want to go, oh, our operations is all crazy. Okay. Oh, well, operations is, is, is not, is, is a bunch of areas. So let's pick one area of operations and start there. And that's where a lot of times when it comes to strategy and understanding what the business problems are first and under, and getting everybody in the same, on the same terms and the same boat of understanding Okay, we're going to start here we want to get here, but we have to take those incremental steps to get there. And then maybe a final, final question. I'm guilty of doing this sometimes. <laughs> Host prerogative. I, I don't have right. to say final question until I really mean it. Um, like, is it fair to say that you know you mentioned continuous improvement? So with lean, we may have step function improvements right. or redesigns. We may have a lot of continuous improvement. Even with that process redesign, we can then continue to improve. Um, it sounds like digital transformation maybe is more inherently a big leap. So am, am I wrong in that assumption? Or can, can we also layer continuous improvement on top of technology? You can't. It, yeah, I say, I say layer it on top of. So I think it's continuous improvement, and then you're laying on the digital, the, the technology or digital transformation on top of that. Um, it's not, I don't, I, 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 I truly feel that you can't have one, you can't have one without the other um, Mm -hmm. because it really does help with the strategy. And it, I think it, um, continuous permit really does a really good job of connecting people, process and technology together. I think you you need all three in order to have a successful business and have happier customers too. So that's our thing. If you're, if your employees are happy, usually your customers are going to be happy too. Yeah. And I think we view these things in threes, like, you know, it says in your bio, simpler, faster, better, Right. people, process, and technology. And then the other trilogy that I really like is in, in whatever order, it's good for the employees, it's good for the customers, it's good for the organization. Yes. Another powerful trilogy. Very much so. Very much so. And I'm hungry and I'm thinking now of, I don't know if you know the term Texas Trilogy. No, I don't. Texas Texas Trinity is actually, so in barbecue circles, brisket, sausage, and ribs, Texas Trinity. There you go. (laughs) Yes, 100%. (laughs) Sorry to take the food detour. I need to go go eat something. But um, Lauren Heisey has been our guest today. Um, Her her firm uh, is Lauren Heisey Consulting. You can find her website at laurenheiseconsulting.com. I'll, I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes if you want to learn more about Lauren and the, and the work she does and um, the help that she can give your organization. So, so Lauren, thank you for um, you know introducing some new terminology. Thanks for your patience with me butchering robotic process automation. You're very welcome. So you helped me. You helped me learn something. I know you helped uh, the audience. I think connect some dots between. Familiar concepts, new technologies. Thank you for working through that with us again today. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me.